Hey there gang, it's Will and I am here to do a video update and tell you a story about building a model airplane. I'm doing this for two reasons. Um, one is because I have joined a group of YouTube scale model builders and this is what we do. We make videos and um, share our thoughts and experiences and um, what we're building and uh, it's very cool. It's, it's a very cool community. The other reason I'm doing it is because I also have a group of friends outside the scale modeling community who have um, you know been with me forever and who know about the spinal cord injury that I suffered in 2009 and they've followed along with my video updates and my blog posts and so on and Facebook and all of that as I have uh, you know been working through my recovery from that injury so this is also for them too so um, what uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, a milestone that I've reached after three years of, of uh, lots of wrestling and that is the completion of my first model that I decided to build in uh, something like 30 years. Um, about three years ago, uh, oh, but before I, before I say any of that, let me, let me go back uh, to uh, all of you guys in the scale modeling community uh, that watched my first video. I just want to say thanks before I forget. I was completely blown away by the number of people that watched that video and just really want to say a heartfelt thanks. I really appreciate that and uh, all the good vibes that you guys sent my way. And uh, hopefully you'll find this uh, contribution worthy of the community. Anyhow, so about three years ago, um, almost exactly three years ago in fact, because it was a Christmas present. Um, I got a. I decided that a model airplane would be a good way for me to work on my fine motor skills. Um, you know, just part of my part of my uh, physical and occupational therapy. And um, I, you know, I built a lot of models when I was a kid, and uh, um, I had to decide which one I wanted to build and it was a pretty easy choice because I love airplanes and I love the P-51 Mustang um, I mean who doesn't right? Certainly, uh, a young Christian Bale does in that clip from Steven Spielberg's *Empire of the Sun*, which is a wonderful movie and uh, is worth watching, even if nothing for no other reason than just to see that clip of the of the flyby. It's, it still gives me goosebumps, no matter how many times I see it. But anyway, I love the P-51, so that was an easy choice. Um, then I had to decide, okay, which model kit am I gonna am I gonna buy? I wanted one that was big enough that I could handle it, so uh, I got a 132nd scale. Um, when I was a kid, all I could really afford was the, just the normal models, the uh, you know the monogram, the Revell, that kind of stuff, and um, so that's what I that's what I always built. But I knew that there were these super fancy models from Japan uh, made by a company called Tamiya and another one called uh, Hasegawa or uh, Azagawa as Martin, my new one of my new English friends says <laughs> sorry I'm sure I butchered that but uh, you guys just make it sound so much more interesting anyway um, 
the Tamiya kit is got uh, it's got several hundred parts and costs about a dollar per part. So I decided I wasn't ready for that, and um, so I got the Hasegawa 132nd P51D, and uh, here's the here's the box top right here. Hopefully that's all fitting in the screen. Anyway, you can see it's a pretty uh, it's a pretty impressive uh, box. Looking at the box lid would be the last time I was impressed. Um, had I done uh, a little bit of research before uh, choosing this particular kit, I would have found out that um, it is widely hated and for lots of good reasons. Um, you know, maybe it was cool in 1992 when it was first produced. Um, it's hard to believe that makes it a vintage kit, right? Uh, but the thing is just terrible. Uh, as Paul says, it's a right pig of a kit. And it's not just the fact that nothing fits together. Uh, it's uh, just the engineering. The engineering is terrible. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, they, give you a, they give you an engine for the kit, which has like six pieces to it. Uh, uh, but they don't give you any way to mount the engine inside the fuselage. <laughs> Basically the instructions have uh, a picture of an empty fuselage and an engine and an arrow pointing from one to the other and you're supposed to just sort of figure that out for yourself I guess. Um, and you know the propeller is supposed to center off of that and, uh, it's but but it's it's just terrible. I mean, and uh, I, you know, on the one hand, uh, could not have possibly picked a worse possible kit for a guy with poor fine motor skills to to try and build. Um, at least if I wanted it to look good, which you know I, I did. That's just how I'm wired. I, I wanted to try to make it good, and. Um, so I had set myself up for a fight uh, with uh, this little P-51 Mustang. But, uh, maybe on the other hand, it would prove to be the best choice. Um, you know, good things in life don't come easy. So, if I wanted something that was really going to work me out, then this was a good choice. And uh, that's what I did right off the bat, is I just... I started picking at it, um, you know, here and there, I would, I, uh, would spend a half an hour or an hour, um, I, I had a wonderful physical therapist, uh, or occupational therapist, gotta make sure and get that straight, because Jennifer will be mad at me if I don't, but anyway, Jennifer would come over to, to uh, our place, and that's what we would do some days for, for OT, is I, I would work on the model airplane, and, you know, a half an hour or an hour of that would just destroy me. I'd have to take a nap afterwards. Um, I, I, you know, when I thought about doing work on it, I thought in terms of doing a single task. Like, today I'm going to assemble the seat and the cockpit floor and the instrument panel, or today I'm going to paint the instrument panel. I mean, that, that, was, the, that was the limit of my thinking. But, I, you know, I picked my way through it. And um, so by the time that I came back out here to my family's farm in New Mexico, I had an assembled and painted cockpit, same with the engine, and uh, I had the cockpit glued into, its, into one half of the fuselage, uh, and that's where I was. So, uh, you know, I picked away at it some more, and um, by the end of... By the time I, I, I sort of got to a stopping point last summer, 2013, I had assembled the fuselage and the wings and was at the point where I could allegedly put the two of them together. And I say allegedly because uh, that just wasn't going to happen without a bunch of, a bunch of work. Um, when I tried to mate the fuselage to the wings, there was probably 50 thousandths interference all the way around. Um, for you non-engineering types, that's about uh, one, uh, well, 
it's about a sixteenth of an inch. And for an object that's only a few inches uh, uh, across, that's ridiculous. And I just couldn't figure out how I was going to get past that, so I put it away. And uh, didn't get it out again until this summer. And at that point, I just decided I was going to do whatever I had to do to get the thing to fit because I wanted to move on. And um, I wrestled with it for quite a few hours, but it actually went okay. And I got to the point where I was ready to start filling and sanding all of the horrific gaps. Um, that one of the things that I figured out pretty quickly was that the hood was not going to fit well, uh, the engine cover. And... Um, since there was no place to mount the engine anyway, I just um, I, I broke off the exhaust manifolds and threw away the engine and decided to figure out a way to just uh, sort of scab the exhaust manifolds onto the sides of the fuselage. And, uh, and I pressed forward. Lots of sanding. Lots of filling. Um, went through three or four different kinds of filler putty, you know, finding out which one was the best one in each situation. and Eventually I got to the point where it was time to prime it. Now here's where things get really stupid and where my poor decision making, um, <laughs> just bad judgment, uh, really started to be uh, my, biggest, uh, my biggest enemy. I, it was time to put some primer on the thing and several years before I had bought a, uh, a can of Tester's Primer, one of the little bitty rattle cans, uh, you know, because in my experience, rattle can primer usually works great. It's easy to spray, and, and even at the time, I knew that even though I, I couldn't operate the button on the spray can, that eventually I'd be able to, and so I just set it on the shelf and, and waited for that time to come, and I was really happy this summer when I discovered that I could, in fact, operate the spray can. Um, and I put a good coat of primer on the model, and, and it wasn't too bad, but it splattered a lot. You know, I just couldn't control my finger well enough. And uh, so there were splatters all over it, and I decided pretty quickly that if I was going to do the paint scheme that I wanted to, or, or any kind of paint scheme and make it look good, that I was going to have to commit to getting an airbrush. Um, and I had one as a kid, but it was like the $15 thing with the Propel cans. And I knew I was... I wanted to do something better, so uh, I bought myself a, a good airbrush, but I wasn't ready to commit to buying a little compressor to run it with. Uh, one of the reasons was because my strategy was going to be to decant the primer from the spray can and put it in the airbrush and spray it that way. I'd seen plenty of things online that said that was possible, and so. Um, and, but the point is, it was enamel, and I was going to have to spray outside which meant that I was going to have to carry all my crap out there to do it. And I wasn't ready to pick up a 10 or 15 pound airbrush compressor and lug it out there and then back in the house. So I decided, okay, well, I've used the little Propel cans before. That's what I'll do. So uh, I bought some of those and uh, I went and uh, did my second coat of primer, you know, because the first coat just tells you how bad off you are. And in my case, you know, what you hope for is that your first coat of primer shows you a skin that is supermodel smooth. But what I actually ended up with was a skin that had more bumps and blemishes than a 14-year-old kid who eats chocolate bars every day and never washes his face. Uh, it was ugly. Um, and so I did a bunch more sanding and filling, and uh, you know, because that's how it goes. Sand, fill, paint with primer, repeat. And I went to put my second coat of primer on, and everything went okay. Um, still had lots and lots of, of work to do with the sandpaper. Um, and uh, so I did that, and I went for my third coat. And I was feeling pretty good um, about things. I was getting a pretty smooth surface, and the areas that needed uh, work were getting smaller and smaller. And, I went to do my third coat and I started spraying the primer and, and after a second or two, and I thought everything was going fine, and after a second or two, 
some sort of glob, that's the only way I can describe it, of bubbly, oozy, disgusting muck shot out of the end of my airbrush and landed right on the surface of my model airplane and just lay there like some sort of ooze from a science fiction movie. I, I, I don't even know how to describe it, but I knew things were going horribly wrong. So I stopped, um, I, I wiped it all off and, and uh, you know, quit for the day. The good news was it was a small area, not too big of a deal. And uh, so I thought, okay, maybe the can of Propel is bad. So I got some new cans of Propel. And then I thought, well, that can of primer was pretty old. Maybe I need a new can of primer. So I got a new can of primer. And I went, you know, got all set up and uh, went to do it again. And I was painting indoors this time and everything seemed to be going fine. And so I painted the whole, I, I primed the whole airplane. And the point about it being indoors is that it, by the time I finished, it was kind of late in the evening and it was a little bit dark, but everything looked good. So I put everything away and, uh, you know, finished the day and went to bed feeling like, okay, maybe I'm finally going to move on to the next stage of this thing and get to put some real paint on my model airplane. I came out the next morning and looked at the thing in the sunlight and I knew immediately that I was screwed because the whole plane still had a wet, shiny look to it. And if you've ever painted primer, you know that it should dry within minutes to a very flat, dull surface. So I knew things had gone wrong, and that was confirmed when I, uh, you know, did the finger test and came away with paint on my finger. Uh, I knew something was horribly wrong. And now my whole airplane was covered with this goop. Okay, hopefully I'm back in frame. I, I had to do a reset there. I had to go dump that little two gig card. Uh, but that's good. That gave me a chance to kind of regroup and uh, figure out how to wrap this thing up in a reasonable amount of time. And I apologize for this being so long, but um, I'm trying to encapsulate three years of, uh, of going to the mat with this thing in, uh, you know, uh, a reasonable YouTube video length. Um, but if you think this is slow, just understand that, you know, how slow the process of building this thing has been for me. Um, you, have, you have to understand that, for example, if I, if I pick up my knife and I want to change my grip, I have to do exactly what you see me doing here. I can't really rotate it around in my fingers very well, so, you know, I have to get creative with a lot of things, but, but that's all right. That's, that's, you know, better than the alternative. So anyhow, to get back to the story, um, I went out on the porch with a pan uh, with a little bit of mineral spirits in it and some steel wool, and, uh, I sat out there just scrubbing that nasty primer off of my poor little airplane. And um, the primer was coming off pretty easy, but as I was going, I noticed that I had a little crack at one of the wing roots, which was a bummer because, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time filling and sanding that wing root. But I just kept working and, and tried to be careful, and then I, I, I realized that the whole thing was just basically coming apart in my hands. Uh, it had not just the crack at the wing root, but it, it had basically broken all the way through the wall of the fuselage right before the cockpit. And I, I was just sick to my stomach, but you know, I just, I thought, okay, I can do this. I, I am not giving up on this little bird and uh, I just made a decision, you know, right then that uh, it just didn't matter what happened. I was going to finish this out one way or the other. And so uh, I got the primer off of it and I took it back inside and I let it dry out for a day and got right back after it with the super glue and the, uh, and the, the, the putty and the sanding paper and and I just worked on it and uh, I also bought myself an air compressor. <laughs> Ah, you know, sometimes you just have to really get uh, kicked around before you realize you need to learn to fight. Um, 
And uh, I, I bought some acrylic paints that I could paint indoors, and uh, you know I learned everything I could about that. And finally got back to putting a new coat of primer on this on this uh, little thing, and um, and uh, got all of the new cracks and all of the issues sanded and filled and, and taken care of and uh, Thanksgiving Day was a pretty good day for me because it was at that point uh, you know my brother was here and that was kinda cool because he was hanging out with me while I was working on this thing and at one point I just handed it to him and I said look I want you to run your finger over this because you've got you know enough feeling in your finger that you can tell am I smooth is it good and he said it was and, I realized that it was finally time for me to be able to move on to the next phase and actually start uh, painting this little thing. And so now I get to talk for a minute about what I chose to, to paint and, and why. Now, the picture on the front of the box is the paint scheme that was allegedly flown by Lieutenant Colonel Claiborne Kiner. Now, I say allegedly because there's no photographic evidence that this paint scheme ever existed. Uh, close, but not quite. Um, what there is is a currently flying P-51 Mustang that they say was allegedly uh, researched very carefully and was painted this way. And what I think, my theory is that what Hasegawa did was they basically just copied that paint scheme from the currently flying plane and and, uh, and, and and they gave you the instructions and the decals to, to do that. But I couldn't find any evidence online that, that the paint scheme ever actually existed. Um, but I didn't care. It didn't matter. It, was, it, it looks really cool. And because it's probably the most complicated paint scheme I'll ever do, I decided, all right, this will be good. This is a good, you know, learning experience. And it fits perfectly with my uh, tendency to do the hard thing. So anyway, um, it was also good because I did a lot of research on Old Kynard and uh, decided that I really had, had made a good choice because this guy was worthy of paying tribute to. He was a square-jawed, steely-eyed, Tennessee Nazi-killing nightmare. And the guy was uh, responsible for turning over, turning uh, 25 German airplanes into scrap metal by the time the war was over, and uh, eight of those were in air-to-air -air combat. Uh, but where he was really a brilliant tactician was in was in uh, ground attack. Uh, basically, if you were a German airfield and you had airplanes out on the flight line, and Kynard was anywhere in the vicinity, you should just pack up and go home for the day because. He was coming to take your lunch money. Um, the guy just went through airplanes uh, like a weed eater. And I kind of have a kinship with the guy because he was a uh, also a civil engineer. In fact, he made his money after the war um, in the pre-stressed concrete beam business where he was a pioneer. So I like this guy, and I felt good about making a, a model airplane that represented him even if it wasn't the exact paint scheme that he carried. I mean, who cares? As Cohen says, and, as I, and I completely agree with, it's your model. Do what you want. So, um, at any rate, um, that's what I did. Uh, about, uh, oh, at least a dozen paint steps later. And um, lots more detailing. And I'm going to show you some photographs so you can get a better look at it. And I don't want to hold the thing too much because the uh, last thing I want to do at this point, especially in front of all of you people, is drop this. But here it is. Man of War. My P-51D Mustang finished finally after three years of, of going round and round. And uh, there are many, many things wrong with this, with this model airplane, um, as you guys will see in the photographs. Um, these gun stains, for example, are evidence of my 
uh, lack of coordination with my airbrush, um, I don't think they would have been quite that heavy uh, unless uh, he was firing 50 caliber black powder muskets uh, from these wings. And uh, this decal, upside down. So Paul, you and I are in that club now. Um, wish I could say I did it on purpose as a tribute to you, but uh, nope, just just me being a dork. Uh, so anyway, I'm gonna set it down now and uh, show you some photographs and and uh, you know say a few more words. But the bottom line is that uh, you know this is this thing is a turd. Um, it's. Uh, you know, you guys know I'm a photographer, and this is a lot like taking a lousy photograph and trying to make something good out of it, you know, using Photoshop. Uh, there's a certain point where you just are not going to make it any better. Uh, it's going to be what it's going to be. And so you just have to decide to live with it, warts and all. Um, but, you know, that's okay. Um, this is kind of like... Uh, you know, imagine that uh, you know you're a uh, uh, that you're in an army and you find yourself behind enemy lines and uh, with just one other guy, and that guy you're stuck out there with is just a real piece of shit. And uh, you know he's a bully and he doesn't carry his weight. He's you know constantly cutting corners and and. Uh, just not the guy you want to be stuck anywhere with, but there you are, and you realize that in spite of everything, this guy is, you know, one of your teammates, and you've got to get the two of you back to safety, and so you do whatever you have to do to drag the both of you back into friendly territory, and, uh, No matter what happens, you realize, no matter how hard this guy makes it on you to try and achieve your mission or, or whatever it is, um, that in a way, because of his own shittiness, for lack of a better word, that you have to make up for that, and you, uh, you become a better person. For that effort, and, uh, you know, this thing may be a, a turd, but it's your turd. And as much as you may hate it, you realize that in your own way that you have to love it. And, uh, but anyhow, um, I knew this was going to happen. At any rate, once you get back to friendly territory, you you uh, realize that <laughs> you're just you're just glad to be done, and that ball and chain is out from around your ankle, and you can move on to something that's more fun. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to enjoy the fact that this model airplane is finished, and uh, I'm going to feel good about that. And soon I'm going to move on to something that I really want to do. <laughs> and uh, that is a lot more fun and uh, hopefully I'll be sharing more videos with my new scale modeling friends um, about my adventures with that and uh, hopefully the uh, stories won't be quite so dramatic and won't take quite so long but if you've stuck with me for this long I really appreciate it and uh, I'll see you on the other side.